is the name we give to the passage of water between Russia and Alaska, the Bering Straits. That was named after a Bering who was a Dane, who was the first person from Europe to traverse that body of water. Uh, we could have talked about astronomy and Tycho Brahe, uh, who along with Kepler was the man who really refined Galileo's a theory that it was the sun which was the center of the universe and made his circles into ellipses and made the whole thing work out pretty well. Uh, there are all sorts of things. Medicine, for example, as one of my friends reminded me the other day, is a place for which Sweden is rightly very famous. There is a medical institution in Stockholm known as the Karolinska Institute after Carolus, which is Latin for Charles, and the German is, of course, Carl, and the king of Sweden was a Carl something. I'm sure he had another name uh, with it. And he created that in the 18th century in order to train doctors for his army, which was constantly engaged in war, to treat his soldiers who became injured. And still today, an immensely famous uh, medical uh, center. Or, for those of you in a lighter moment, I uh, like to play duplicate bridge. You may have noticed that in recent years, the winners' columns are full of spins and carls and all sorts of Scandinavian names because really this young cohort of bridge players has practically taken over uh, that uh, department. I'm unable to offer them any challenge, apparently. Uh, so uh, there are all sorts of places that we might have dealt, but we don't have a lot of time, uh, and I have chosen instead to talk about essentially about two, and peripherally about several others, uh, the two being the theater and music, because I think that it is there that Scandinavia has played uh, the most formative role in the way in which those two things have emerged uh, in uh, the West, and they should be recognized, and we ought to know something uh, about them. So let us start with theater, and then we'll move on to music, and then we'll move on uh, to fine art uh, and architecture, and end, you may be surprised to hear it, with American crime novels, uh, but that lies ahead. Now the theater in Europe uh, was an artwork which had immense authority uh, and immense reputation from the 15th to the 18th century. I mean, think of the names, uh, beginning with Shakespeare, uh, or if you cross the channel with Moliere, Cornelia Racine, or if you go across the Rhine into Germany with Goethe and Schiller. This was a magnificent episode uh, in the history of the state. But by about 1800, it had begun to deteriorate very seriously. Uh, the new thing in the theater was something which contemporaries began to call the well-made play. And it was a silly concoction uh, of melodrama and farce, uh, which dealt with highly improbable coincidences, which clever and witty people who talked cleverly and wittily uh, got themselves involved in. But it was very formulaic. It had a certain pattern. You had all of these people. They got involved in all of these situations. And so the stages were laid out with lots of doors on either side. And if a door opened on one side, you could be sure it was shutting on the other as a new set of perplexities entered the stage and said clever and witty things. The supreme monument of that sort uh, of playwright activity uh, is Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest. It's one glittering phrase after another, one improbable situation after another. But the formula of the well-made play dictated that in the final act, all of these various plots become coalesced. You begin to understand why it is that they, these clever and witty people have got themselves uh, involved in them. And then they are resolved in a happy ending. Well, it is interesting. It is certainly entertaining. But it is not, I think, what we would call serious. And by the middle of the 18th century, uh, there was some dissatisfaction with it. One reason in the Scandinavian countries 
that we're getting tired of it, was that it was essentially a French phenomenon, these well-made uh, plays. Uh, they were the product, in particular, of two writers. One was Eugene Scribe, and the other was his successor, who lived down to about 1910, uh, Victorien Sardou. And they both wrote countless plays of the sort I have just tried uh, to describe, which were very popular and very, very successful. They also were very prominent as writers of opera libretti. Uh, for example, Scribe uh, often helped Verdi out in his operas, uh, and Sardou contributed to Giacomo Puccini, uh, the libretto for the great opera Tosca. But their essential fame is with the theater. And they are remembered today by two quite different monuments. Uh, one in Paris, in honor of Scribe, is the great avenue which crosses the Avenue de l'Opera immediately in front of the Opera Garnier, the great ornate house. That is at the intersection of the Rue de l'Opera and the Rue Scribe. And the other, you have to go to New Orleans for them. Sardou once visited the Crescent City, and when he was there, he was entertained at Antoine's restaurant, and they created a dish for him, which the last time I was there was still on the menu. It is called Ugh Sardou, Sardou eggs, and it is a toxic amalgamation uh, of artichoke heart swathed in hollandaise sauce uh, and whipping cream and all sorts of other things. Uh, but uh, probably fatal to ingest. I've never eaten it, but it is still there, named for him. Uh, a great and very famous man. Now, there was increasing dissatisfaction, however, with this sort of theater, in part because it was French, in part because it was silly, and one place that this was particularly felt, as it happens, was in Norway. And the reason for that was, was that the Norwegian theater was totally in the grasp of Swedes and Danes, which in itself did not make it well like, but those Swedes and Danes were very much part of this French tradition. So there was a movement in Norway to free the theater there from these outside influences, which were considered to be noxious, uh, and to create a real Norwegian theater that would deal with real Norwegian people, with the ordinary dilemmas of human life. And that was a movement which gradually began to take shape, and the place which we associate with it was the last call on this trip, Bergen, because there was the single theater which really was dedicated to trying to improve what went on dramatically uh, in Norway by introducing Norwegian themes into plays to make them plays that dealt with ordinary people and particularly to give women a serious role uh, as figures in drama because they were for the most part in the well-made play uh, simply decorative figures who came in and said clever and witty things and then darted through a door so another one could come in uh, from uh, the other side. And the theater in Bergen, while it had not made a lot of progress, had at least expressed a desire to have things change. Now that is where we first encounter a native of Bergen, whose name was Henry Ibsen, born in 1828, so by mid-century he was a very young man. But his family had lived there a long time and had a lot of good connections and he was eventually awarded the directorship of the theater in Bergen under the condition that he write one play to be presented in the repertory every year. And he used that opportunity to write three plays, he only lasted three years, that dealt with Norwegian people, ordinary people, entrapped in recognizable human situations. And so these were performed. They unfortunately were flops. But one has to remember that Ibsen was a very young and untried playwright at this point, not anywhere close to maturity. 
Uh, and after three years, his contract was not renewed. And he was bitterly disappointed. And he decided to abandon writing for the theater and instead to write a colossally long poem about the adventures of a young Norwegian man whom he named Pierre Gint, who leaves Norway and wanders across the world encountering all sorts of obstacles and difficulties and a few pleasures. And then as an old and very tired man returned to Norway where he died. Well, this here again is in five parts and it takes an equal number of hours to produce it. It is immensely long and so it usually is presented in an abridged fashion. But in 1876 when it was first presented it was a resounding and that is not <coughs> nearly uh, as encouraging an adjective as I wish I could find to say what the reception of this poem was in a Norway already tired of the well-made play. It was an enormous, colossal success. And for the last 140 years since it was composed, it has been the single article of cultural faith of the Norwegian people and by association now the Danes and the Swedes as well. It is a monument of their culture because it deals with old Nordic themes it has a great deal uh, in it about ordinary, poor, or barely prosperous Norwegians who are concerned with the problems of life with which all of us are familiar. And in particular, the dilemma of women who face the problem of having their own independence in the face of social rules which decree for them a backseat position in life and society. And this becomes now the leitmotif of the later drama of Henrik Ibsen, which has been for a century now immensely famous. He wrote an, any number of plays which are still performed all the time uh, today, not only over here but in our country, that deal with this question of the individual on the one hand, and the women in particular, and society on uh, the other. The three probably most famous ones are A Doll's House, Ghosts, and Hedda Gabler. But there is another which strikes a remarkably familiar thing, which doesn't have a lot to do with women in it, but does treat the dilemmas of society. And this is one which was called An Enemy of the People, how a group of city councilors managed to hide a desperately dangerous but fatal era in the production of the municipal water supply in a Norwegian town, and many people died as a result of their selfishness and unwillingness to reveal that they had themselves, in fact, been responsible for this disaster. Echoes of Flint, Michigan. Uh, very timely even in our own day. Now these plays which Ibsen wrote became very familiar and very popular uh, in the theater in Bergen and elsewhere in Norway but we are interested in how they became the great theater pieces of the late 19th century not only in all of Europe but across the Atlantic in the United States as well. And the way in which it happened was interesting, I think, and involves one name very familiar to all of us. And that was that in Norway, there was a young man named William Archer living, who was an Englishman who had for years lived in Norway and become a theater critic for the Norwegian press. And he had seen these plays, the later plays, had a Gabber and Ghost of Doll's House and so forth, of Ibsen and recognized in them an antidote to the absurdity of the well-made play, which otherwise was still a very popular. And he wrote, he was a correspondent uh, for English papers and Norwegian papers, and he wrote article after article praising Ibsen. And he sent them as well to London to his very close friend, 
who was then himself a dramatic and music critic. And this was the name you all know. His friend was George Bernard Shaw, who had not yet himself written the play, but had pronounced various servant judgments on countless plays by other people. <laughs> In any case, Shaw immediately recognized that in Ibsen he had himself found the antidote for what Shaw loathed and what he called Sardou Dumb, Sardou Dumb, Sardou Dumb, uh, the great French dramatist of the well-made play. And he read these plays that William Archer had sent him. He began to describe them in his columns to urge his friends, dramatic producers, uh, to bring them out. And he even wrote a book in the second year after his acquaintance uh, with Ibsen called The Quintessence of Ibsen, in which he said, here at last we have a dramatist who knows what the theater is really about. And that is the contest that exists in life between the expectations of society on the one hand and the desire of individuals themselves to be themselves on the other. And Shaw decided that he would begin to write a play. And so he said, I'm now going to give you a unpleasant play, which was a dig, of course, at the term well-made play. And this was one called The Landlord's Houses, in which he tells of the dismay of a young man who comes to learn that the great family fortune is based on slum landlordship. Well, this play by Shaw has long since been forgotten, but you have, you all know, I don't need to say, he is the really <coughs> magnificent figure in early 20th century drama all over the world. And as a admirer of Ibsen, that did a huge favor to Ibsen's reputation. And Shaw saw to it that A Doll's House, as well as Ghosts, were presented on the London stage in the late 1890s, and they were not only critical, but also box office successes. And from there, they crossed the Atlantic and had an equal fortune in the theater in this country. And by certainly 1892 or something around there, when Ibsen by now was 60-ish, uh, he was a famous, famous name on both sides of the Atlantic for uh, his drama. He also exerted an influence beyond the stage. One of his admirers was a man, and somehow didn't get on the little list here, Arrigo Boito, B-O-I-T-O, who was Italy's most celebrated libretto. And uh, Boito was a good friend of Giuseppe Verdi, the great lion of Italian music at this point, of course. And he persuaded him to come out of retirement. Verdi had stopped writing operas after Aida, which was composed in 1871 to celebrate the opening uh, of the Suez Canal. And as you know, it has a nilotic kind of an Egyptian theme in it and all very tragic and gruesome and so forth, but fantastic. Uh, and he said, Barry, you need to write another opera or two, and you need to know about this man, Ibsen, and what he thinks the theater should be, because opera is musical theater. And he managed to persuade Verdi to come out of retirement. And if you study Verdi's last two great operas, Falstaff and Otella, they both have unmistakable traces of Ibsen in them. Concerned with real human dilemmas and how or whether, in fact, they can be uh, resolved. Then there is another case, again, of a name that you know well, James Joyce, then a very young Irish novelist. He was so taken by Ibsen's plays that he decided he would study Norwegian in order to be able to read them in the original. I don't think that succeeded. But that was at least his aim, and Joyce was a great admirer of Ibsen. So that we have this man, a born in Bergen, Norway, 
who by the time of his death in 1906 was the great famous star of the stage, or not star, stage, sorry, played writing uh, in Europe, imitated all over the world. And people who study drama have seen in Ibsen the great influence he played on a number of American writers, Eugene O'Neill, Thornton Wilder, uh, and there are even some who say that Tennessee Williams is clearly in his grasp. And as you all know, Tennessee Williams very often deals with the problems particularly of women who find their own desires to fulfill themselves thwarted by the expectations of bourgeois uh, society. So this is a very great name, and one for which we are, to which we are much indebted for what he did to create a serious sense of theater in the Western world. Now, in Bergen, he owed the position which he had, uh, and indeed much of some of his fame, to his association with the world of music. And this came about through a man named Ole Bull, whom you've never heard of, I suspect. Uh, but I can tell you he was so famous that when he died in 1880, it is said that there has never in the history of Norway been a funeral to equal the one which was afforded to Bull. He was a man involved in the theater. It was he who arranged for Ibsen to get that initial contract to write the three buddies for the theater uh, in uh, Bergen. And he didn't lose his faith in Ibsen when those proved not to be uh, successful. But he meanwhile had turned from his own interest in the theater to his real passion in life, and that was the violin. He had once heard the great Italian virtuoso Paganini play, and he said, I am going to become the second Paganini and he succeeded in realizing that ambition. He was the most extraordinary violin virtuoso uh, that Europe probably has ever seen, or at least the most well uh, known. Uh, he was followed by huge crowds, and he loved it. He was Europe's first rock star, performing all over Europe. And the proof of the pudding here is that he was so much in demand and such a public figure that Phineas T. Barnum decided to hire him to appear with his circus and at a very handsome contract. Uh, Ole Bull now began to follow the elephants around Europe uh, and perform on his violin and he played not only a good many classical sorts of things but also Norwegian folk music that he adopted, adapted uh, for uh, his violin. Now, Ole Bull was a friend of a family in Bergen, where they were all from, who were Scots by origin and spelled their name G-R-E-I-G, Grig. But they had fled in 1745 after the Stuart Rebellion of that year, which failed, and fled to Norway and renamed themselves Grieg, G -R -I -E -G. G-R-I-E-G. Uh, and it was Bull, uh, who was connected by marriage uh, to the Greeks, who fostered the career of a young man named Edvard Grieg, uh, destined to become the most famous musician that Scandinavia uh, ever produced. And what Bull did was to arrange for this young man, Edvard Grieg, to get a scholarship awarded by the Norwegian authorities to go and study in Dresden in Germany, which was the great music conservatory uh, in those days. And one of his fellow students there was Arthur Sullivan, the music man of the team Gilbert and Sullivan. We don't unfortunately know whether they ever met one another. There's no indication uh, at all, but it was very fine training and Grieg then returned to Norway, and he began to write a number of small pieces, usually for piano, that were based, many of them, on Norwegian folk song that became very popular, and then he turned to grander 
pieces on a really instrumental scale, and the most famous of them, which is still a great part of the international repertory of pianists, is his piano concerto, which is a friendly and superb work. He became a very, very famous musician. And he decided that while he loved to compose in Norway, because there he could draw on these native things, he needed to continue to spend time on the continent because that was where the real musical activity was. So Greek is an unusual man who has a foot in both Norway and particularly uh, in Germany, and he becomes, consequently, a real figure of international notice in the world of music. Again, the proof of the foot. He is the only musician who ever has been awarded an honorary doctorate, not only by Oxford, but by Cambridge as well. A very simple, unassuming, humble man, an internet, a great figure in the international constellation uh, of musicians. And when he died in 1970, uh, all of Europe felt that it involved uh, one of its greatest figures. Now, it is not only Greek and instrumental music for which Scandinavia is justly famous. There is another aspect of it which I think of some interest. And that is in vocal music. The two greatest soprano interpreters of Richard Wagner's music are Kirsten Flagstad, a Norwegian, and Birgit Nielsen, a Swede. They manage somehow to last through the interminable arias, which Wagner wrote uh, for sopranos and tenors and basses as well, but to do so flawlessly. And both of them achieved a fame beyond recognition. Barnum had long since died, so they weren't joining the surface anymore. Uh, but they were tremendously famous. But they're not as well known as the single greatest vocal name in musical history that emanated from Scandinavia. And that belongs to the woman known as the Swedish Nightingale, and that was Jenny Lynn. Now, she was a lovely looking and a tremendously able uh, singer uh, who began in Sweden, where she had been born. She, too, had been taken in tow by Phineas T. Barnum and joined the circus as it made its way, not only around Europe, but in the United States uh, as well, and attracted a huge following. Nowhere was she so popular as in England, because her most devoted fan was the song, Queen Victoria. And on her last concert tour in England in 1857, she appeared in London in the concert hall no fewer than 16 times. And Queen Victoria, with poor Albert in tow, was there for every single one of those performances. And they always ended with her theme song, which is a vulgar way of describing what was her most favorite. Piece, and that was the wonderful aria from Handel's Messiah. I know that my Redeemer did it. That brought the house down. There was nothing like hearing Jenny sing. I know that my Redeemer did it. She made an enormous fortune. It is reckoned to have been somewhere in the neighborhood of $15 million in our terms. She gave it all to charity, or almost all of it, which was her one. She was a lovely lovely, wonderful, good person, and very pretty. Men fell in love with her. We know that. And we know particularly of one man who fell madly in love with her. But unfortunately, he was a socially very awkward man and not handsome by anyone's reckoning. In fact, rather ugly looking. Uh, and he pursued her. He proposed to her. He was rejected by her but he continued to love her for all of his long and lonely life. And it was he who wrote a story which was really about Jenny, although he called it the Nightingale, and that's how she got 
her nickname, the Swedish Nightingale. And that man, who also gave us Thumbelina and the Little Mermaid and countless fairy tales and other stories, was, of course, Hans Christian Andersen. And if it hadn't been for Andersen, whose fame was immense, we're getting out of music into something else, we wouldn't have Winnie the Pooh, we wouldn't have the Wind and the Willows, we wouldn't have Peter Rabbit, we wouldn't have Alice and the Looking Glass, because all of those authors were in thraldom to Hans Christian Andersen. They loved and admired him. So we have been hugely enriched by adoption through Jenny Lynn of these figures uh, as well. Well, that is music, and you will excuse me if I don't go into the death metal thing, uh, which arose <laughs> in 1980 in Copenhagen, uh, and is, of course, notable or notorious uh, for its low-tuned guitars, its frantic drumming, its insane lyrics, all delivered to drugged-out young audiences by musicians whose groups are known, for example, as autopsy, or morbid angel, or obituary. Uh, we don't need to deal uh, with them. Let me turn now instead to the fine arts. This is not a big chapter in Scandinavian history, but I think it's an important one. And I noticed that when we got to the Glyptotech yesterday in Copenhagen, everybody headed for Rodin. Rodin in Copenhagen, I don't think so. There was a whole floor dedicated to Danish art. I went there, and I think it's wonderful. But I have rather conservative taste uh, in art. These are fair representational drawings of lonely, landscapes, toiling peasants, frustrated <laughs> intellectuals. And so they're sad and unhappy, but I think they're wonderful. And they don't cost a lot of money in today's art market, uh, which recommends a uh, highly. Now, the one figure, the one artist who really stands out, whom Scandinavia has produced, is a man named Edvard Munch, who died in 1944. And while he lived a long life uh, and painted a great deal, he really is best known, and to some people known solely, by one painting which he reproduced four times in slightly different media and slightly different poses. And this is called The Scream. It's a highly autobiographical picture because Munch was crazy. He believed he was crazy. I believe he was crazy. He really, he was a tortured, so, and this is a picture of a man who resembles him with his mouth wide open and colored red inside screaming out against the world. One of these four copies was sold about, I think it was 2012, for $130 million. That was, at that time, the highest price ever paid for a painting. Uh, and it was sold by a Swedish shipping king to, shouldn't surprise us, a Wall Street hedge fund magnate uh, who paid that for it and turned around and sold it uh, for a profit. But it was eclipsed in the auction market by a Gauguin, which two or three years ago sold for $300 million. But until that time, it was Minch's screen which held uh, the record. Now, there are not any other artists, I think, that we need to be concerned about. But there is not only fine art, but there is decorative art. And there is also architecture that we might spend a moment or two uh, talking about, because they, too, are important. You may know, some of you, of the extraordinary silversmith, who's a sweet George Jensen. He founded uh, his business in 1922, and he went on to become uh, the one of the leading purveyors of tableware and sterling silver uh, in all uh, of Europe. It's quite modernistic in its style. It's quite heavy. I think it's quite beautiful. I don't know. I admired it in the distance. Uh, and it has been a huge ingredient uh, in the artistic commerce uh, of Denmark, where he was uh, from. 
uh, ever since then, but it is vilely expensive, so I would not suggest that you get involved in it unless you have a real passion. Uh, so, there is another one, which is the product of the Royal Danish Horseman works. But this one is a very interesting one in a historical sense. In the 1760s, the then king of Denmark decided that he wanted for his botanical library a drawing and a printed description of every single flower and every single moss that grew in the kingdom of Denmark. And so he assembled a great number of artists uh, and botanists to go out and collect all of these things. And they did, and they bound them in volumes there in the Royal Library. But someone had the idea of taking these drawings and having them hand-painted on porcelain, which up until that time had been white with the gold border, but of very, very high quality, made by the Royal Danish Porcelain Works. Almost every kingdom in Europe had its own porcelain manufacturer. And this is the way in which the great dinner services that are known as Florac Donica, Danish flowers, came into existence and is still made today. The origin of it was that the King of Denmark, who had commissioned this prodigiously intensive sort of, of examination of all the flora of Denmark, decided that he wanted to get in the, grace, the good graces of Catherine the Great, the Empress of Russia. She was a fanatical collector of porcelain and manufacturer of porcelain. And so he had an immense service made, dinner service, table service, made for Catherine. But it took years to produce. And by the time it was finished, Catherine was dead. So he just kept it. And it's in one of the palaces in Copenhagen part of one that unfortunately we didn't get to see the Amalian board uh, there and it is trotted out I'm told on great occasions by the Queen of Denmark when she has to entertain foreign dignitaries but it's made for common folks like us so should you desire it you can lay out the last time I checked out on the internet about $1,100 for a salad plate or if you really get enthusiastically into this business, eighteen thousand dollars for a terrain in this Florida down time. But it is glorious and handsome, uh, and something which is an important element uh, of sweet of the Danish commerce today. Now there are also other there are decorative arts as well that is a decorative art. There are other decorative arts. You know the term Swedish modern is tossed around for anything that's angular and not interesting. Uh, but <laughs> it is made in huge quantity and no one pervades it with such extravagance as Ikea, which is a family-owned Sw uh, Swedish corporation. And it isn't the only famous well-known Swedish or, or Scandinavian corporation. There are a lot of others. Electrolux, which helps keep your house clean. That is a Swedish corporation. Lego, who makes the children's toys, is changed. The only one that you might be tricked by is Dansk, which makes all sorts of clothes and other things like that. Dansk means Danish, in Danish and also in Sweden. It's not Danish at all. It's American. But its original designers back 50 or 60 years ago were Danes, and so they decided, what a good idea, we'll just call it Dansk, and that's the way in which it originated. Uh, but there is a considerable manufacture in Sweden of things like IKEA uh, that produce articles for our houses or clothes for our bodies uh, and so forth. And this has been an important economic development uh, for them. There is there are a number uh, of others that we could go into, but let me conclude by talking about architecture. There is many a noble building in Scandinavia. There is practically no, there are practically no familiar names, which is a little bit of a problem. But I thought I would ask you a question. It's just a rhetorical question. I don't expect an answer. I'm answering myself. 
Uh, and that is, if you were asked to nominate a building built in the last 50 or 60 years that you think is the most beautiful and most exciting and indeed revolutionary structure that you can imagine, what would it be? But I suspect some of you would give the answer that I would to that question, which is it would be the Opera House in Sydney, Australia, with those great sail-like ceilings that look like, and it sits on the water, and as you approach it from distance, it looks like a great ship coming out of the bridge. That is the product of a Swedish architect named Jay Utzon, and it's wonderful. Now, to conclude, I don't know what you brought for reading material uh, when you're not in lectures uh, on the trip, but my wife and I brought along the latest David Baldacci thriller, uh, which is called King and Maxwell, about a man and woman who are detectives, and they are involved in many hair-raising adventures. But one of them, and one of them, they're associated with the sidekick who, for various reasons, has to go into deep underground for a fairly long period in order to avoid being rubbed out by the bad guys. And so they say to him, whatever his name is, say it's Axel or something, Swedish name like that, you've got to disappear. We don't care where, but you've got to stay there deep underground for at least two months. And he said, well, where should I go? I don't know where I'm going to go. They said, that's for you to decide. Just get moving. He's a final conversation with him. He says, well, he said, I've always wanted to see the Sydney Opera House, so I'll go there. So he went off. I hope he survived. I know he was thrilled by what he saw. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Well, John has.